My name is uh, Jerry Berman, and I'm the chair of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, and I'm also president of uh, the Internet Education Foundation, and Tim Lorden is my gift to all of you, and uh, the great job that he does and his staff. Um, this is our ninth uh, conference, and I think that each year as I attend the panels uh, or participate in them, they get more sophisticated, more uh, intense, more uh, driven with data, and, and each year I think that it grows in importance as a conference which does discuss the state of the net, looks at the technology, looks at the policy issues, looks at trends, and creates a networking of the internet policy community with members of Congress and the executive branch. And it's, I think, uh, become really important. Uh, my, it's my pleasure to introduce the chair of the Internet Caucus in the House, Representative Bob Goodlatte, who's been here and we've worked together, I think, since uh, 1999, 2000. It's been a long time. Oh, sure. Uh, uh, my notes say when I was a young man. But, I, but uh, in any event, he, He's, I've worked with him as an advocate for privacy and civil liberties, and he's always, we've been on the same side of issues, we've been on different sides of issues, but I think together we, we, we've worked on this concept that no matter where you are on the issues, it's really important to understand this technology if you're going to ever reach a consensus and, and do something which benefits uh, the whole uh, internet digital economy and, and open space. And so, uh, Keeping that in mind, we've we put advocacy aside and really talk about policy issues here and bring everybody in the community together from all different parts of, of the public interest, nonprofit, uh, corporate, and um, and government sides to really talk about trying to find understand the issues and find common ground. But uh, let me we have a, a great discussion uh, this which. Uh, Representative Goodlatte is going to host and moderate, but I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, the chair, who now, has now become the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, which not is quite as prestigious as this chair, but, but uh, an important position from which to discuss these issues. Representative Goodlatte, thank you. Thanks, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry, thanks for that kind introduction, and uh, I am uh, proud to have the, the challenge and the opportunity to, to uh, chair both uh, of those organizations, and I hope to have the two of them work closely together to promote uh, uh, the interests of uh, the tech community uh, here in Washington. And I remember, Jerry, you, you were a young man, and I was just a kid when, <laughs> when all of that started out. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's great to have the opportunity to, to uh, chair of the House Judiciary Committee. I want to give a shout out to Tim Lorden, uh, who has done a great job. You hired him, so you get some credit there, Jerry, but <laughs> Tim has carried on, and uh, really the Internet Caucus is one of the most influential of the literally hundreds of caucuses that we have, and it's, uh, it's very important to have the kind of reach into uh, the Congress and the education that uh, your organization helps to provide to House members senators, uh, and all of their staffs is absolutely uh, critical to dealing with the amazingly complex issues that jurisdiction spreads, not just the judiciary, but obviously energy and commerce and ways and means and a number of other committees uh, in the Congress as well. So uh, we look forward to uh, working together and uh, utilizing uh, our efforts with this new uh, connection between the Judiciary Committee and the Internet Caucus to see that uh, we're advancing uh, tech issues. It is great to uh, be able to do this again this year. Last year we had uh, uh, the CEO of, uh, of the founder of Pandora uh, and chairman of the board and uh, the amazing technology that he's deployed uh, in that sector of the economy. And now uh, we have another area that just demonstrates how pervasive uh, technology is and how disruptive technology uh, is uh, transforming uh, America and the globe. Uh, we have uh, Travis Kalanick, the CEO and founder of Uber, and I had to admit to him that uh, I Ubered over here for the first time uh, to uh, 
be able to introduce him. I couldn't very well not have used this service, but now that I have, I'll be using it all the time uh, here in I'm Washington. I'm very glad to hear that. And I'm sure, and I'm sure that that's the experience uh, that uh, many of you who've used it uh, have as well. It's, a, it's an amazing uh, transformation of something that has been done one way for a long, long time and now can be done much better because of technology. So let me ask you, how many of you, Uber? All right, look at that, we're getting there. All right. We're getting there. Well, uh, Travis is uh, a, a computer science graduate of UCLA. Uh, he calls himself a serial entrepreneur. Uh, we know that that means uh, in, the, in the tech community, that means that uh, uh, he has taken uh, his uh, uh, savvy and uh, helped develop a number of different uh, technologies and companies, and now he's settled on one that uh, uh, I hope to see him uh, expand pretty uh, dramatically. They're in more than 30 cities now. Uh, about half of those are in the U.S., but they're, they're going global, and we're going to talk about uh, what it takes to, to take a, a great idea and uh, transform the world with it and all the challenges that come from it. So, Travis, welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, it's really good to be here. Uh, I, just one little correction. I went to UCLA for computer engineering, but I didn't graduate. Ah, okay. So. Well, that's not uh, a hindrance. Uh, my son worked for, for Facebook, and uh, people here from Microsoft yeah. and so on. So they know about CEOs who don't graduate. Look, it's, it's, it's a lot easier when you have some modicum of success to say that. Um, but <laughs> beforehand, it's a little more difficult. So. Great. Well, uh, absolutely delighted. Why don't you tell folks, uh, I saw about uh, maybe a little less than half the room who haven't used your service, so uh, why don't you start off with a, with a free advertisement? Wow. Um, well, I was, it's, it's pretty awesome, guys. We, Uber's been in D.C. for a year, right? We just hit our year mark. A year ago, if I was at a place, you know, at, at a lunch like this, nobody had heard of it. At least 90% of you, 95% of you hadn't heard of it. So, look, our motto says it all. We're everyone's private driver. And since so many of you have used it, um, I think it's, you know, I don't have to go too deep into it. But, you know, you, you push a button, and in five minutes, a town car arrives. And we're in cities across the country, most cities, most of the major ones. A couple that we're not is mainly because, uh, you know, the regulatory bodies and City councils have set up laws that make innovation very difficult, um, but we're working on that. Uh, of course, we go to cities sometimes where, where the regulators and the city councils you know, give us a little flack at the beginning. We go in when we're legal, we do, but that does not mean that existing, the, the powers that be, especially the taxi industry, like, like it when we do. And so there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens, um, and I think D.C. was a particularly interesting situation. Anybody who uh, sort of kept up with that, um, man, I mean, it was a it was a real it was a it was a long battle. But a, a basically, in December, uh, the city council passed a law that you know essentially said it, it, it clarified for the city for regulators that yes, indeed, Uber is legal and uh, we're sort of here for the long run. Um, so we're really happy about that. I mean, I could just start riffing and take this whole thing, but I'll, we'll, yeah, we'll I'll, make it a Q&A instead of I'll, me just I'll going I'll take it part of the way. way for you because when I go outside of the Longworth building across the street and wait for a cab, yeah. I sometimes get a cab like that. Yep. Sometimes I wait a long time before I find one that doesn't sure. have an occupant in it. So when I used Uber, Uber I uh, uh, could see that, that vehicle coming up Independence Avenue <laughs> to pick me up that's right. and know how many minutes it was going to take to get there. I mean, that's an amazing uh, uh, competitive uh, advantage. Plus, I didn't have to uh, uh, deal with any kind of cash that was already taken care of sure. uh, and uh, get a bill later on. Yeah, fair enough. So, you know, one of the things that's also interesting about it is that at the end of the trip, you rate your driver, right? And uh, many of you may not know this, but the driver also rates you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what that means, what that means is that it's a system of accountability, right? It's a system where, you know, they're coming down Independence Avenue, you know they're coming. Um, if I don't like his rating, can I send him away? Or what's uh, well, no, actually what happens <laughs> is if, if his ratings are not good enough, he, 
we no longer partner with that limo company, right. essentially. Um, so, so that's how we keep the accountability up. Um, and there's just so much data because of technology. There's so much data that we have to make the system work so much better than it has before. And I think a lot of our customers have experienced this. Um, but, but going to the other side, there's, we, I think as riders, we all know what that experience is like. And, and I think it's captured the imaginations of a lot of our customers. But on the other side of this, um, it's pretty meaningful for the drivers, right? So I like to say we give riders high fives, uh, but we give drivers hugs. And uh, the reason is, is because uh, it's very difficult to be in that business. Uh, quite often, either you're working with taxi industry, which treats most drivers pretty poorly, um, or you're trying to make, you're trying to start your own business in the limo side of things. Um, and it's, you know, you're, you, you're booked in the morning, maybe you're booked in the afternoon, but you have these huge swaths of time where you're not. And what, they, what happens is we fill out that downtime. And that means consistent, steady cash flow for the driver, which means he can make ends meet. That's, that's really about feeding families. But then it also is investing in their business because they have this consistent cash flow. And that means, you know, we've seen a number of drivers go from you know, one car in their fleet, right? A limo company of one car to 15 or 20. And each of those cars grossing 100 grand a year. So these guys are living their American dream. And I think that's a side of what we do that I think a lot of folks don't see. Um, but folks, if you, you know, anybody's taken an Uber, if you start talking to the driver, I think you'll find, you'll find that out pretty quickly. Excellent. Now, this wouldn't happen without the smartphone. Uh, smartphone hasn't been around all that long. You've been around three years, eight months, so you didn't waste too much time after uh, apps started coming into being to uh, develop one uh, that uh, people can put on their smartphones. Yep. What other technology challenges or hurdles have you had to face to do this? Well, it's interesting. I got this question earlier today. We've been around for two and a half years. We launched in San Francisco in June 2010. And we couldn't have launched a year earlier. We couldn't have even launched six months earlier as an example, because um, the battery on that phone, even when it was plugged in, couldn't handle all the stuff we were doing in the phone, because we give all the drivers phones, right? And that's how you can see where that car is at any time. Uh, the battery would go dead even if when it was plugged in. So it was like we had, to, like the battery technology had to get to a place where our app wasn't just draining the battery because what would happen is that driver would be going when we were testing in January of 2010, the driver would go for two or three hours and his battery would be dead. And it didn't work. But when the next generation of iPhone came out, boom, it did. And that's when we took off. Um, but there's other things. I think, uh, you know, I think we've seen, we've seen a lot of areas of technology, you know, access to information it, it can be very, you know, can be something that's really important, data and information. Uh, in Uber's world, uh, mapping data is absolutely critical to making sure that things work. Um, when you push that button, you have a pin set of where you're at. I need to be able to turn a GPS location into an address, right? If we can't do that, our system doesn't work, right? Because where's the driver supposed to go? He's got to know where to go. And so, uh, you know, kind of an interesting thing, we, uh, well, we use Google Maps for that geo for that geocoding. Um, and if, if, you know, my own personal experience is that um, if I want to find my house on a Google Maps branded product, I can. I can set the pin and it sees my address. I'm not going to say what my address is out loud here, but, um, <laughs> but it can find it. If I do it on a Google Maps, uh, over the Google Maps API, which is their partners, uh, I can never, even using Uber, I can't find my own house on a map. And for, you know, we're not sure why, but for whatever reason, there's degraded information on the premium partner API. We're not sure why. But that is sort of the next, that's sort of the, the, the next frontier of sort of access to data um, and sort of technology that I think is becoming really important for us. It's mission critical. And I think a lot of new technology companies that are out there are going to need that kind, are going to need quality map data. I'd say probably 5% of our trips have faulty address data because of that geocoding that happens. Um, now, maybe it's only a couple, couple houses down. Sometimes it's five blocks away. 
But how does that affect the system? Well, it means that drivers sometimes call riders because they're not sure that the address they've been given is accurate. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes they go 10 blocks away and the ETA is 20 minutes instead of three or four. Right? So it, it can have a mission critical impact, some of, this, some of these types of things. So in your, in your challenge in dealing with uh, local governments yep. where you want to set up your operations with regard to regulations and taxes and basically a protectionist environment, yep. uh, how much of an asset have your customers been, both in terms of developing the demand in a community before you get there? Sure. That's sort of what happened with Facebook at different colleges yeah. and universities before they got yep. there. Uh, and how much do people who use it in other places showing up in a new city uh, and not finding it there help you to? Well, you know, I think maybe it, it would help for me to give a little bit of backdrop of the kinds of laws that might exist in a place where we're not, right? So as an example, and then I'll get into how sure. customers change the, sure. change the ball game and how I think congressmen, senators, City officials, I mean, the world is going to change because people are in social media. That, so I'll get to that in a second. But let's start with where the laws are, right? So example, Uber's not in Miami. Why? Because we are not even close. Like, under the existing laws that, ex that, that are in Miami, there's no way we could exist legally. So we don't roll out there. What kinds of laws are we talking about? If you called for a town car in Miami-Dade County and it came in 15 minutes, by law, you would have to stare at that town car for 45 minutes more before you're legally allowed to get in the car. By the way, mine came in three minutes here. That's right. And if that's legal here, that's legal. Right. But in Miami, it would have been illegal for you to get in that car until 57 minutes more had passed. You can't contract for the limo less than one hour before that's it's right. going to be delivered to you. No, you, you have one hour minimum pickup time, OK? All right? The second law in Miami-Dade County is like, OK, so you're a good citizen. You wait the hour, right? Oh, by the way, if, if you get in that car, that car can be impounded, the driver can be cited, in some cases arrested. Um, second part is that once you get in that car, the minimum fare is $80. Even if you're going 10 minutes down the, down the road to go to a restaurant, the minimum fare is like 20, 30 times higher than the minimum fare of a taxi. They, they want to make sure that only rich people can take town cars. The middle class, it's, it's bad for them. Not allowed. Bad idea. And so um, that's the second law. And then the third one is there are 500, something like 550 town cars that are allowed to operate in Miami-Dade County. Um, what that means is that if you are a limo business, a sedan business, and business is doing well, the only way your business can grow is if somebody else shrinks. And so we have to go into Miami and get these laws changed because there's no way Uber can operate in that world. Our minimum fare here in the district is $15, not 80 um, but really should be set by the market, not by some sort of protectionist scheme. Because when I tell people this, they're like, why, would, why is it that way? That sounds crazy. Well, it's to make sure that taxis are the only game in town. That's the idea. And guess what? Some of the worst taxi, some of the worst taxi um, service in the country is right there in Miami because of that kind of scheme. And the drivers are totally screwed over because the taxi industry is the only option. There's no option for those drivers to go somewhere else to make a living. So everybody gets screwed. So what does that mean you know, for us? Well, we have to go into a city and, and, and say, hey, this technology is good. It's going to create thousands of jobs. Um, and uh, you know, riders are going to be doing great. People are going to be able to get around that city. It's good for tourism, business, et cetera. Um, small businesses, these, you know, we're going to create thousands of jobs in the process, but you know, indirectly through the companies that connect to us. Companies often with one driver. So that, that's where we go when we're not legal. That's sort of how things go. When we are legal, we go, we roll out, and then you have, uh, you have interesting situations that come up. Uh, it could be that there's a different interpretation of the regulation. Um, in the District of Columbia, we had a situation where there was a sedan defined as a car that can carry passengers, six or fewer. Um, and can charge by the, on the basis of time and distance. But we had a particular regulator who was under the impression that you can't charge by distance. And so it's like, here it is, black and white. But again, it's the taxi industry will call their regulator or call their city official and say, shut these guys down because they're not used to competition. 
So what we do in those situations is we go big on social media. We tell our customers in the city when one of these quote unquote flare ups comes up and we say, be active, speak up, send an email to an elected official or a regulator. Um, I hear that works sometimes. It does. <laughs> so we did, we, there was a law that was proposed here in DC that basically would put our minimum fare at five times that of a taxi, right? The, the bill was rolled out, it was called the Uber Amendment, and the rationale, it was literally called the Uber Amendment, the rationale was we can't let sedan companies compete with taxi companies. That was the rationale, right, in the law. And it was rolled out at 4 p.m. on a Monday to get voted on at 11 a.m. on a Tuesday. And uh, it was basically setting, our, setting the price of a Uber five times that the minimum price, five times that of taxi. So what happened is we, I, I penned an email or you know, typed, in a, typed an email very quickly, sent it to our user base who was very passionate about what we did. There are 50,000 emails sent to, Congress, or sent to city council people, original emails, these are not robo emails. Number two, 37,000 tweets. And number three, there's 104 million social media impressions. And by 11 a.m. the next day, that bill was rescinded and we were allowed to continue to operate. So, so Congress is not the only place where we're subject to that kind of... Uh, well, and I think that's something that's going to get more and more interesting is, you know, taxi bills, taxi laws, this is backroom deals, man. That n no, none of us know about that in the, in the right. world that existed five or ten years ago. It just didn't. But it affects us. It affects city life. And now that social media is out there, bloggers are everywhere, and somebody, a company like us can connect our customers to those regulators through things like Twitter and Facebook, et cetera. There's just a huge, massive increase in accountability um, that I think makes the world a better place in a lot of ways, it's certainly when it comes to transportation. Let's um, open it up to the floor for questions. I'm sure that uh, there's some things people like to hear about that we haven't touched on yet, or you uh, may want to follow up on something. Ari Schwartz there. from the Department of Commerce. Um, I, you had at one point had an issue with uh, metering in Boston. Oh, and, yeah. and we spoke about it. That's an um, interesting one. And I was wondering if you could, you know, you could tell the history about it. Yeah. Wondering if that, that's happened in other jurisdictions as well. Yeah, so uh, the issue that, that he brings up is in Boston, uh, the Division of Standards was, was uh, given a call by the the taxi industry, the taxi industry said, hey, this phone that we put in these cars is, is a meter. That's what they were saying. Uh, it's not a meter. What it does is it basically um, gets GPS signal and just forwards it to our server. That's all it does. But that said, the Division of Standards said, look, we don't have a standard for use of GPS in a car. Um, and so until we have a standard, you can't exist. And what we said is, well, no, actually, the Division of Standards, the way it works is, you're supposed to come up with a standard and then you're supposed to enforce it. You're not supposed to enforce a standard that doesn't exist. And um, put out a press statement, a lot of social media happened, articles got written, we didn't actually have to send an email. We call that the nuclear weapon. We avoided that. But within 24 hours, Deval Patrick rescinded the cease and desist. And so that was the situation. But I think the taxi industry is, is going to attempt to use the meter this meter concept as a way to try to shoehorn us out of markets. And let me explain. The, the meter, a taxi meter is only allowed in a taxi. If a meter exists, if a taxi meter exists in a non-taxi, then that's an illegal taxi. And if it's an illegal taxi, it's gonna be impounded, essentially. Um, and so they're trying to broaden the definition of what a meter is so that we are um, shut down in cities across America. And they can do that through weights and measures and divisions of standards, things like that. If they can find a way to change the definition, they'll, they'll try to do that. Other questions? I kind of feel like I got Thanks. to stand up and pace a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Del Bianco with NetChoice, and it was fabulous to watch the way your fans and customers, all of us, rose up in a place like the district. But moving into a city where you don't have any customers yeah. yet, 
Miami's that, gonna be that first test. That, that's an area we need to count on allies. And, and I'm looking at what happened in the district just recently. Yeah. Have you made an allies of the taxi drivers? Because over the past two weeks, yeah. I've been able to use taxis with Uber here yep. in the district. How's that working out? Well, so look, so we've, we've always been a friend of the taxi drivers because we're creating, essentially creating jobs for taxi drivers that are far better paying, right? So um, that's number one. But number two, we are rolling out taxi because guess what? It's like a low cost Uber. So it, more people can do it. We're everyone's private driver. So, um, so yeah, I mean, basically the only folks that are left out of it is the existing taxi industry, the taxi companies, but the taxi drivers love us. Um, in fact, we've been out, and we've been doing taxis in DC for a week, and then that first week we had several drivers make $1,500 in that week in addition to the fares they were already doing. Think about what that means for him. Right, a guy who normally makes eight or nine dollars an hour, right, and what it means for his family. Um, so it's a big deal, and we're really, we're really excited about the possibility of this unmet demand um, because of the technology that we use. Over here, while well, he's getting to her, say a word about uh, entrepreneurialism. You have uh, this isn't your only. This isn't uh, the only startup. Uh, you've had some successes and maybe some that are not as successful. What's the common theme in the ones that work? Oh, man. I mean, there, I don't know if there's a common theme in the ones that work. Uh, I, my last company um, was a, uh, a networking software company, low-level low level networking software. And I was about five years too early to market, <laughs> which means I did four years without a salary. I like to call that blood, sweat, and ramen. And uh, <laughs> at some point, people, people, even your friends, think you're crazy. And uh, it, can be, it can get pretty lonely when you get to that point. But uh, what it does is it develops, if you believe in what you're doing and you push through, it ultimately succeeded. Um, if you believe in what, you do, what you're doing, you push through it. I think that experience for me made me principled enough and able to stand by my principles hard enough to do something as hard as what we're doing in the cities that we go to, because guess what? These, you know, these taxi guys are not messing around. Um, they play dirty, and there's a lot of regulatory capture that's happened that makes my life pretty hardcore, and I've gotta be able to stand up to that, so. Thank you, my name's Lorelai Kelly. I'm at the Open Technology Institute at the New America Foundation. I have a question for the congressman. Um, you just mentioned in passing the tremendous institutional challenges that sort of the communications revolution has brought on. Congress is operating now with about 80% of 1979 levels of staff, and it's also getting about 800% more incoming contact from the outside world. And I'm wondering, uh, with your new position at Judiciary, but also as someone who's really been on top of this inside Congress for years now, uh, could you give us some examples of policy areas that could mimic or, or do something similar to um, what Mr. Kalanick has been describing in the private sector? And who's doing this well? Uh, which, uh, who of your peers do you think sets a really good example for the institution? And do you have any plans to, to sort of take this forward uh, on judiciary? Well, first of all, uh, government is not... Uh the best at disruptive technology. Uh, the, the forces that he's dealing with on a local level are magnified when you get to a national level. So change in the Congress doesn't come as quickly as it should. I can remember about a dozen years ago, Yahoo Internet Life named me the most internet friendly member of Congress. And I was very proud of this. I went home to see my son who was 14 at the time. He's since uh, been uh, through and beyond uh, Facebook. but. I said, Bobby, Yahoo just named me the most internet-friendly member of Congress. And he, without missing a beat, he looked at me and he said, gee, Dad, that's sad. <laughs> so uh, we that's do. That's so good. That's so good. We do uh, try to learn from what's happening in the tech sector and bring that technology in. But you would think in an area as important as immigration law that we would have a federal government uh, that uh, uh, kept track of their documents and the processing of those uh, as efficiently as a credit card company would. But we're nowhere near that. And uh, so we have great challenges in getting the kind of incentives 
in place to do it right. Because unlike uh, Travis's company, where you know none of this is going to happen if he doesn't show a profit at the bottom uh, of his ledger sheet. And uh, the government doesn't work that way. And there are lots of forces in there that want to find other ways to steer you off. So how have we handled the dramatic increase in the communications with government in, in congressional offices like mine compared, I wasn't there in 1979, but thankfully, but uh, in the time that I've been there, we've gone from virtually no emails when Elizabeth Frazee was my legislative director to 95% probably of the communications we get today, at least 90% are coming in in the form of, of emails and texts. Uh, to my office. So we use technology to respond far more efficiently than we did back then, and we can therefore handle a much greater volume. But to, in my opinion, the best way for the Congress to get more efficient in handling these things is to open up the process to get input from where it needs the input most. That's what we are. We're a representative democracy, and uh, we need to be getting more input from people who know, not just your constituents, which are obviously the most important source, but specific constituents who know about specific things or people from elsewhere who can provide information. So the better we use technology to gather information rapidly and then have the right people, you don't have to have more people as much as you have to have the right people to identify it and try to deploy it. And, uh, we're, we're doing that in the Judiciary Committee I just took over a week ago, so give me a little bit of time, but you're going to see uh, more uh, efficiency and more information available about the committee's activities uh, and more efficient ways for people to get it, use it, and deploy it. And we welcome suggestions from the outside about how to do that, too. Um, I am uh, uh, definitely going to be... Uh, looking to some of the key people in the Congress. You asked for others. Uh, Kathy McMorris Rogers, our new uh, Republican conference chair, uh, has long been a, a pioneer in pushing other members to uh, uh, utilize technology. My answer to my son, by the way, was, well, they're talking about how I understand the policy, not how I use the technology. Uh, he didn't buy it then. I don't know that he still does, but uh, that's, that's really the most important part of my job. But my job can be done better if we uh, uh, use that technology as efficiently uh, as possible. So I, I try to be, I'm not a first adapter usually, but I try to be close in behind. And we're going to try to make the committee operate that way too. That's right. That's right. And I'm hooked. So uh, Tim is telling me we're running out of time. So we've got one more question. I, I see three back there. Can you answer three like at a... Fast approach. Okay, I see it looks three, like three right in a row back, back there, and we'll try to do all three, and then we got to go. I'll, I'll do speed round here. Sure. Yeah. So it, it, one of the key takeaways is that you've not just innovated the transportation industry, for, uh, but also kind of innovated the use of social media to influence public policy. And there are a lot of government affairs folks in the room. Yeah. Just any any lessons as you've kind of uh, followed that path of innovation, and also. Um, did you foresee that when you were going and pitching your VCs ahead of time? No. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first is there's a lot of lessons to be learned. I think if you do some searching on Uber and the different cities we've been in, you can find out about it. But basically, we are building a playbook for how to do this. Other companies are going to follow suit in all kinds of industries that tech is affecting. And I think folks in D.C., as well as in cities across the country, are going to be, you're going to be in the middle of it the way DC was for us. I mean, grant, uh, you know, the thing to remember too, though, it, here's, here's, I was supposed to do speed round, I didn't, but at the, at the end of the day, DC listened to the people, right? And the right thing happened at the end because their voices were heard and the, the people, the, the city officials who were elected listened. And so, um, I think that's the thing that makes me most positive and less cynical about city government is that. Is that, uh, like for instance, Mary Che here, uh, did, I think Ward 3, she listened and she eventually embraced innovation and made DC a place of innovation, which matters. Um, and uh, that is first speed round. Sorry for going so long. No. And then my question is, can Washington DC help, can Congress maybe preempt 
local laws through the Commerce Clause. You guys looked at that issue to, to try to... So, the, you know, you look at the laws that, that I was talking about in Miami as an example, right? And that's some seriously anti-competitive stuff going on there. And the thing is, is if that were done outside of government, that would be illegal. But any competitive measures that are done through local government, as far as I know, through antitrust laws, et cetera, are actually legal. If there's a federal way to deal with that so that I don't have to spend a lot of time doing politics and more time building product and tech, I'm all about it. It's just not something I know much about, so maybe you guys can tell me. We've been talking, and uh, let me just say, we've got to be careful to separate out the principle from the idea that maybe the federal government could preempt everybody and have their own regulatory process. We've seen that happen in many places, and it's not necessarily an improvement over having to deal with individual yeah. governments. And, yeah, and so I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I actually agree with that principle, and where I'd go with it is there are situations that are egregious, where there are egregious anti-competitive things that are happening in cities that shouldn't be happening. And if there's a way to say, hey, look, this type of anti-competitive behavior is just not right. And uh, that would be great if there was a way to make that work for me. But uh, I want to compete. I'm not asking to not compete. Um, I'm not asking to protect me. I'm looking to compete and to get prices down and provide great service. Um, and sometimes these measures make that not possible. Are we good? All right. Well, let's give Travis a round of applause. Thanks for sharing with us. Yeah. Appreciate it.